Stage 7 Exclusive Attention and Unifying the Mind 7. The goal of Stage 7 is to effortlessly sustain exclusive attention and powerful mindfulness. With the conscious intention to continuously guard against dullness and distraction, the mind becomes completely accustomed to effortlessly sustaining attention and mindfulness. Practice Goals for Stage 7 You enter Stage 7 as a skilled meditator. You can achieve uninterrupted, exclusive attention, along with a powerful mindfulness that includes continuous metacognitive awareness. At first, it can take some time and effort in each meditation session to reach this level of focus, and there will still be days when you can't quite get there. Also, as wonderful as these new abilities are, you can only sustain them through ongoing effort and vigilance. Any lapse can lead to a loss of focus, and if not quickly corrected for, the return of subtle distractions and even dullness. This constant watchfulness and the subtle effort needed to sustain exclusive focus, which continues throughout most of Stage 7, is tiring and quickly mars the initial satisfaction you felt at your achievement. Stage 7 is about the transition from being a skilled meditator to an adept meditator, one who can constantly achieve and effortlessly maintain exclusive attention and powerful mindfulness. Achieving effortlessness is your goal for this stage. Effortlessness requires complete pacification of the discriminating mind, which is also the essential first step in unification of mind. Until there is unification, unconscious sub-minds continue to be at odds with each other, creating instability. With complete pacification, however, there is enough unification that the mind is compliant and rarely needs correction. Thus, an adept meditator can drop all vigilance and effort, allowing the mind to settle into an unprecedented state of inner calm and clarity. To bring about unification and complete pacification, you simply keep applying effort until it's no longer needed. However, because exerting effort has become such a strong habit, knowing when you can safely drop it is a separate challenge all its own. Then, even when you know effort is no longer needed, you'll still have to learn to let go of being in control. You'll also encounter a few other obstacles at this stage. Long periods of maintaining exclusive focus through vigilance and effort are necessary, and they seem very dry because not much happens. This can create doubt, boredom, and restlessness. Other times you may experience unusual and often unpleasant sensations that challenge your ability to stay focused, and your body may jerk, twitch, or rock back and forth. These are, of course, manifestations of the early stages of PT described in the sixth interlude. Occasionally, you may also find yourself overwhelmed by feelings of joy. There's also a good chance you'll have to go through further purifications similar to those in Stage 4. Your powers of patience, determination, and diligence will be tested and retested. But remember, these are all part of the unification process. Therefore, Ignore all these distractions, remain diligent in your practice, and you will certainly succeed. You have mastered Stage 7 when you can consistently let go of all effort, yet stable attention and powerful mindfulness persist. You have completely pacified the discriminating mind and made your first great strides toward unifying the mind. Complete Pacification of the Discriminating Mind Complete pacification of the discriminating mind means that the competing agendas of all the individual thinking, emotional sub-minds get set aside in favor of a single, consciously held intention. In other words, the mind system as a whole becomes more fully unified around the conscious intention to attend exclusively to the breath. When competing intentions are eliminated, attention naturally becomes more stable. Although this pacification process started in Stage 6, it was only temporary. 
Pacifying the mind in that stage meant that when we successfully ignored mental objects long enough, the discriminating mind projected fewer of them into consciousness. But this state was sustained only by the strength of our intention to ignore all distractions. If that intention ever weakened, the unconscious sub-minds of the thinking, emotional mind began to project thoughts into consciousness again. In stage seven, you must remain diligent and exert effort to maintain pacification until there's enough unification for complete pacification to occur. Then you can drop vigilance and effort and sustain stable attention effortlessly. The instructions for completely pacifying the discriminating mind are simple. Just keep doing what you've been doing. Remember, you don't pacify your mind. It happens by itself when you repeatedly achieve exclusive attention and sustain it for as long as possible. Practice experiencing the whole body with the breath only as needed toward the beginning of this stage to achieve exclusive attention. Maintain a high level of introspective awareness so that whenever a potential distraction emerges in the periphery, you can immediately strengthen the focus of your attention on the breath. In doing so, you're also renewing the intention to ignore potential distractions. Learn to appreciate the simplicity and pleasure of exclusive attention. Habituating the mind to exclusive attention. Constant repetition habituates the discriminating mind to exclusive attention and increasingly powerful mindfulness until we have the experience of complete pacification and effortlessness. Whenever we sustain exclusive focus, the mind system's executive functions are overriding the intentions of other sub-minds. This override trains unconscious sub-minds of the discriminating mind not to project their content into consciousness. Furthermore, by enjoying the experience of exclusive attention, by savoring the pleasurable, restful silence it produces, we're training some of those sub-minds to adopt the intention to be vigilant and immediately correct for distractions. As a result, whenever something arrives in peripheral awareness accompanied by an intention to become an object of attention, the trained sub-minds respond by projecting an opposing intention. As you can see, the subjective experience of pacification is not caused by the discriminating sub-minds going dormant. They are as active as ever. In this case, they actively participate in the intention to sustain exclusive attention. This is how and why exclusive attention becomes effortless. Diligence, Vigilance, and Effort The path to complete pacification can be summed up in a single word. Diligence. Diligence means constantly persevering. It's the center from which vigilance and effort radiate to create a primed and engaged mental state. Vigilance means having introspective peripheral awareness that's clear, alert, and ready to detect whatever may threaten the stability of your attention. Like a vigilant sentry, Awareness is purposely watchful for any potential distractions. Vigilance also takes some effort, but most of the effort goes into attention. You constantly generate the intention both to remain exclusively focused on the details of the breath and to immediately correct for potential distractions. So diligence underlies both vigilant introspective awareness as well as the effortful intention needed for exclusive attention. Such diligence takes a lot of energy. In a way, it's like learning to juggle. At first, you have to constantly coordinate many different activities, speed, timing, posture, watching for errors, making corrections, and so on. Once you have a little experience, you can consistently keep the balls in the air. But it's still tiring. Maintaining exclusive focus of attention in Stage 7 is similar. You can do it, but it's hard to keep up for long. The other challenge is that you've been so successful in your practice to reach this stage, it's easy to back off on the effort. Yet it only takes a brief instance of slackening to be suddenly caught by a distraction and for the balls to drop. 
Similarly, if you're ever tempted to rest on your accomplishments, you can easily slip into a state of cruise control. In meditation, cruise control means slipping into a state of subtle dullness. And if you don't catch that subtle dullness, it's only a matter of time before you're distracted again. After lots of practice, an expert juggler no longer needs to focus so intensely, and can even carry on a conversation while effortlessly keeping the balls in the air. Riding a bike is another example of an activity that eventually becomes effortless through consistent effort. And so is meditation. Therefore, even though all this effort seems to contradict the goal of effortlessness, it must be continued until it's no longer necessary. As you progress, everything will become more and more automatic. But what truly produces effortlessness is the fact that unconscious sub-minds no longer try to take over. Effortlessness means attention is placed on the object and stays there because there's nothing in the background trying to draw it away. Then, and only then, is there complete pacification, meaning diligence, effort, and vigilance can cease. The Problem of Dryness With diligence, you can stay highly focused and alert for longer and longer. As you do, however, the satisfaction and excitement you feel at the end of stage six starts to wear off. Periods when the meditation feels satisfying become interspersed with periods that feel dry and tedious. Nothing new happens. Any lapse in diligence, and you'll lose your focus and mindfulness. Yet all this effort no longer brings the satisfaction it once did. People often feel stuck or doubtful. What's the matter? Maybe I'm doing something wrong. We can get caught up in strong feelings of restlessness and impatience instead of just recognizing them as mind-generated distractions. The temptation to give up and do something else can be great. I personally had a long stretch of tedious practice at this stage. I didn't know it was a normal part of the process, and remember thinking, my concentration is nearly perfect, I sit day after day, and this is all I have to show for it? What's the point? Where's the rapture and bliss I've heard about? Unfortunately, I quit practicing for quite a while as a result. This can be a dangerous time for your progress because of boredom and doubt. But it's easier to tolerate if you understand what's going on and are expecting it. Fortunately, most people at this stage will have occasional episodes of joy and pleasure, piti sukha, and experience unusual bodily sensations, involuntary movements, and colors and lights. These are brief, infrequent, and unpredictable, but nonetheless break the monotony, helping to overcome doubt and keep us motivated. But the real antidote is confidence in your abilities and trust that it's a process that just takes time to mature. When you feel stuck, restless, and doubtful, Try not to react to those feelings. Instead, cultivate an attitude of acceptance and patience. When they arise, just notice and accept them. Resettle your attention on the meditation object and try to regain a sense of peacefulness and calm to counter the restlessness. Also, take as much satisfaction as possible in just how far you've come, reminding yourself that if you persevere, the rewards will surely follow. You should also review the first interlude on hindrances and problems, especially doubt and impatience. There are three additional practices you can do to add variety to your meditation and help you through these dry periods. An investigation into the nature of thoughts through introspective awareness, an intense form of close following, and practicing the pleasure jhanas. These practices are all very rewarding in themselves while still unifying and training the mind in stable attention and mindfulness. Investigation of Mental Objects This practice involves maintaining exclusive focus on the breath as you non-discursively investigate mental objects with metacognitive introspective awareness. This kind of purposeful activity helps counteract feelings of boredom due to the dryness of this stage, while deepening your understanding of how the mind works at the same time. Observing the breath 
has become quite automatic by now, and this practice requires only a partial shift of conscious power from attention to metacognitive awareness. Because you're maintaining exclusive attention on the breath, pacification of the discriminating mind continues. By this point in your practice, mental objects such as thoughts, memories, and emotions rarely enter consciousness. When they do, they are easily noticed. To begin with, observe the three primary forms that thought takes. Self-talk, visual images, and kinesthetic feelings. Thoughts are often in the form of words, phrases, or sentences, and can easily become long inner dialogues. Other thoughts take the form of images, such as when you think of cooking dinner and have an image of your kitchen. Memories are often verbal or visual as well. You're doubtless quite familiar with these kinds of thoughts. The third kind are when we kinesthetically feel ourselves doing something, such as the thought or memory of picking up a phone and dialing. Emotions also fall in the kinesthetic category. Just as you can have the kinesthetic memory of a physical act, you can have the kinesthetic experience of an emotion like jealousy. In the course of this inquiry, you'll be especially aware of symbolic thought. The words and phrases that appear as inner self-talk are obviously symbolic, standing for something other than themselves. But so are mental images and the mental representations of physical actions, like the urge to scratch your nose, for example. One of the things you may also notice is the incredible speed of symbolic thought. It's so fast that individual thoughts, especially the components of individual thoughts, such as a particular word or image, are fleeting and hard to identify. In those intervals when symbolic thought is absent, we can legitimately say no thoughts are present. Yet as you keep observing, you'll start to notice a lot of mental activity in peripheral awareness that is pre-verbal, pre-image, and pre-sense it. This reflects the ongoing conceptual activity of the thinking emotional, and is what gives rise to symbolic thought. We are not ordinarily conscious of non-symbolic conceptual thought, but it starts to leak through when conscious experience is no longer dominated by symbolic thought. Times when thought seems completely absent are well worth observing, too. When the mind is engaged in the present without grasping, neither looking to the future nor the past, then joy, happiness, and energy arise. This often happens during walking meditation, or with any ordinary kind of concentration where we become totally immersed in the present. It happens here in stage seven, too, but can easily go unnoticed. Being fully aware of joy and happiness directly counters the dryness of this stage and promotes unification and pacification of mind. Close following. This practice is a more intense version of the following the breath technique you learned earlier. Only this time you want to identify even more thoroughly the many distinct sensations that constitute the breath at the nostrils. Set your intention to follow the microscopic movements of sensations. As you focus in more and more, you might discern half a dozen or many more different sensations for each in and out breath. As you continue to examine these sensations quite closely, your perception shifts and you'll start experiencing the breath as jerky or pulsing rather than smooth and continuous. The jerks typically come at about one or two pulses per second. At first, it may seem like it's just your heartbeat you're feeling, or that your heartbeat is somehow affecting the breath. You can investigate this by intentionally expanding your scope of attention to include both your heartbeat and the breath sensations. If you can't clearly perceive your heartbeat apart from these pulsations, then put your finger on your carotid artery focusing attention on both your pulse and the breath at the nose. Continue to maintain exclusive attention and introspective awareness, of course. You'll eventually discover that the pulsations of your breath don't actually coincide with the beating of your heart. Once you've satisfied your curiosity, look more closely at the content of each jerk. 
you'll find continuous change occurring within each one, as though they were made of very short clips from a motion picture. The changes consist of recognizable sensations, like warmth, coolness, pressure, movement, and so forth, arising and passing away. Yet as you probe deeper, you'll start detecting subtler sensations you can't easily label. You are now reaching a much finer degree of discrimination. If you continue, at some point your perception will shift again. Instead of pulsations, within each of which there is continuous change, you'll experience what feels more like a series of still frames, occurring at about ten per second. Here you're giving the mind an activity to perform that produces novel experiences. What makes it useful for your practice is that you can only sustain this investigation by staying vigilant and highly focused. Any slackening of attentional effort or vigilance will lead to disrupting distractions. If you're lucky, perception will shift one more time. The still frames will dissolve, becoming something too rapid for the mind to clearly discern. You will then experience the breath sensations as the rapid flickering on and off of separate moments of consciousness, or simply as vibrations. Some meditators interpret this experience of momentariness as the universe continuously coming into and going out of existence. That description is quite accurate in terms of a person's subjective universe. When this happens, there's nothing the mind can recognize or hold on to, so it naturally recoils from the experience. The mind jumps back, so to speak, to a place where things are recognizable once again, where it can apply familiar labels and concepts to what is being experienced. This is an insight experience. If you can re-enter this vibratory experience, you can gain clear insight into impermanence. You may realize that all there ever was, is, or will be, is an ongoing process of constant change that cannot be grasped or clung to. Things don't actually exist. Process is all there is. Then, if you can overcome the mind's resistance enough to go in and out of this perceptual state repeatedly, it will become an insight experience from which you can gain insight into emptiness. First, you'll observe how uncomfortable the mind is with that level of perception, and how desperately it wants to pull back and organize this experience conceptually. Then you'll realize, at a very deep level, that the familiar world of forms is shaped entirely by the mind's attempt to make sense of an empty reality. Dharma teachers often speak about the world as being merely a projection of the mind. This direct experience of the mind, creating meaning out of emptiness, allows us to understand exactly what they're referring to. It's not that the world doesn't exist. Rather, the world you perceive, your personal reality, is nothing more than a construct of your mind. These realizations happen if you're really lucky. But there are two significant caveats. First, if you spend a lot of time doing this practice, you'll have a spillover into your daily life. You'll see everything as impermanent, which can really throw you off. Familiar feelings of certainty and purpose disappear, which can produce a sense of hopelessness, even despair. Things lose their usual importance, and life can seem pointless. And it's all the more disconcerting because these emotions have no logical basis in conscious experience and seem to come from nowhere. In fact, they are produced by unconscious mental processes trying to assimilate your meditation experiences. In the Theravada tradition, this state is called the knowledge of suffering, dukkha nanas, and is in some ways comparable to the dark night of the soul in the Christian mystical tradition. These insights into impermanence and emptiness can create aversion to practicing. But stopping your practice is probably the worst thing you can do in this situation. The second caveat is, don't count on having these types of inside experiences. Some people never experience sensations dissolving into a field of fine vibrations. Others don't recoil from the experience, 
but actually find it delightful and intriguing. If you fall into the latter group, you can expand your scope of attention to include the whole body, experiencing it as a shimmering process of sensation too subtle to describe easily. Remember, the purpose of this practice is mainly to help you overcome the dryness of stage seven and to continue strengthening exclusive attention and mindfulness. It's a creative way of applying your abilities to help you practice more productively. There's a strong possibility it will produce inside experience, but it's not guaranteed. If they don't come now, rest assured they will come later. Pleasure Jhana Practice The pleasure jhanas are a more powerful and satisfying absorption than the whole body jhanas. As the name indicate, you use pleasurable sensations as your meditation object. The pleasure jhanas are particularly helpful in countering the tediousness of this stage. More important, the state of flow in jhana induces a temporary unification of mind, which in turn promotes more lasting unification, thus speeding up your progress through stage seven. To have access to the pleasure jhanas, you'll need exclusive attention to the breath of the nose. Both mind and body must be quite stable and still. Your subjective experience should be one of sustained stillness, stability, and mental clarity. Your breath will be slow and shallow, and the sensations faint. Nevertheless, your awareness of the sensations will be so acute it almost hurts. It's normal to still have peripheral awareness of occasional sounds or other sensations, perhaps even the faint whisper of a fleeting thought. You know they are happening, but like the awareness of clouds in the sky or cars passing on the street, they barely qualify as conscious experience. Even so, if you relax your vigilance, they can still draw your attention away. Achieving the flow state of jhana will change that. When you have achieved this level of access concentration without shifting your attention from the breath, explore peripheral awareness to find a pleasant sensation. They can be just about anywhere, but try looking in the hands, the middle of the chest, or the face. If you have trouble finding a pleasant sensation somewhere in your body, try smiling slightly. This is very helpful and often produces a pleasant feeling around the mouth or eyes. In fact, smiling when you meditate is a good habit to cultivate in general. By the time you arrive at access concentration, the fake smile you put on when you started meditating will have become genuine. Once you've found a distinctive, pleasant sensation, shift your attention to it. Staying focused on a mildly pleasant feeling won't be as easy as focusing on the sensations of the breath. You will even find your attention wants to return to the breath because focusing on it has become a strong habit. Practice just letting the breath sensations stay in the background while remaining introspectively aware of how attention alternates between the pleasant sensation you've chosen and the breath. It usually doesn't take too long to get the hang of this. Then attention will no longer alternate at all, becoming exclusively focused on the pleasant sensation. Focus your attention, in particular, on the quality of pleasantness rather than the sensation that gives rise to the pleasantness. Just observe, letting yourself become completely immersed in the sensation, but don't do anything. Let the pleasantness intensify. Sometimes, though, it will fade away. In that case, allow your attention to return to the breath. Stay in access for another five minutes or so, enhancing your peripheral awareness to allow any physical or mental pleasantness to arise. Once it does, try again. Sooner or later, the pleasant feeling will intensify as you keep focusing on it, which makes it easier to remain attentive. Pleasantness won't necessarily grow stronger in a linear or continuous manner, so be patient. As long as it doesn't fade away, just observe without reacting. Definitely don't push or chase after it. If you do, it will simply fade, and you'll have to return to the breath for a while and try again. As the pleasantness builds, you may experience unusual sensory phenomena, 
including strong energy sensations that can cause trembling and spontaneous movements. These are distracting and can be hard to ignore, but just hold the intention to let them remain in the background of awareness. Don't be concerned if attention starts alternating with them, as it did earlier with the breath. That won't stop absorption from happening. In fact, if you're lucky, you may experience a release of this energy, accompanied by strong, pleasant sensations in the body, and a brief period of joyful happiness. This gives you a taste of what's to come in the first pleasure jhana. The pleasantness will grow incrementally stronger, in fits and starts, until it suddenly takes off. You feel as if you're sinking into the pleasant sensation, or as if it has expanded to consume all your available conscious bandwidth. You've entered the flow state that is the first pleasure jhana. If you've already practiced the whole-body jhanas, you'll immediately recognize the feeling. Trembling and energy sensations tend to persist in this first jhana. When you can easily enter the first jhana and remain as long as you choose, consider moving on to the second pleasure jhana. The physical sensations and movements grow more stable in the second jhana, and the feeling of happiness becomes more pronounced than the physical pleasure. While pleasure jhana practice doesn't have the same potential for insight as close following, it's a far more enjoyable way to cultivate effortlessness. Distraction due to strange sensations. While you're well on the way to pacifying the discriminating sub-minds, the sensory sub-minds still function as they always have. Pacification of the senses begins in stage seven because you're ignoring all distractions including sensory input, in order to completely pacify the discriminating mind. As discussed in the previous interlude, pacifying the senses produces a variety of bizarre sensory experiences. Because they are intense and unusual, and especially because they break the tedium of long dry periods, these sensations can be very powerful distractions. It's almost as though the senses produce these strange sensations in an attempt to catch your attention. You may have already experienced some strange sensations from time to time, such as tingling, or a feeling of bugs crawling on your skin, burning sensations, or feeling a cold draft from nowhere, pressure on the top of your head, or distorted body sensations. You may have seen lights behind your closed eyelids, or heard noises with no external source. Such sensations probably occurred when attention was particularly stable and would have been brief and easy to disregard once you realized they weren't important. They were manifestations of grade one PT, the minor grade discussed in the last interlude. At this stage, you can expect these unusual sensations to happen much more frequently, last longer, and be more intense. Also, while they used to occur mostly one at a time, now several arise at once. These are episodes of incomplete pacification of the senses, belonging to momentary grade two piti. You will often feel energy coursing through your body, as well as physical movements, including rocking, sudden jerking, and twitching of the hands and fingers. Sweating, salivation, and tears can occur as well. You may even experience incomplete sensory pacification corresponding to grade three, in which multiple sensory phenomena arise together, repeatedly becoming very intense and then subsiding in a wave-like pattern. Moments of intense joy and happiness can also occur, but not sustained periods of meditative joy. That will come in stage eight. Just do your best to ignore these phenomena letting them mature on their own over time. Don't chase after them, but don't push them away or resist them either. They will arise and pass away according to their own agenda. Your task is just to let them come, let them be, and let them go. At the end of the next stage, once your senses have been fully pacified, these strange sensations will actually give rise to physical pliancy and fully developed meditative joy. Calming the bodily formations while breathing in, he trains himself. Calming the bodily formations while breathing out, he trains himself. 
Anapanasati Sutta. Purification of Mind Revisited At this stage, you may also re-encounter the purification process you experienced in stage four. This comprises another major set of distractions, including strong emotions, disturbing images, powerful memories, and other volatile material. This purification process is extremely important. In fact, your progress through the remaining stages depends on it. So welcome this process if it arises. Deal with these issues in exactly the same manner as in Stage 4. If you need to, listen to that chapter again and refresh your memory. Why didn't these issues come up in Stage 4? Most likely because they were met with too much inner resistance at the time, were too deeply buried, or were just too subtle to be recognized earlier. If you haven't already, start using the Mindful Review practice. This practice will stir up material needing purification so it can more readily emerge in the silence of meditation. By confronting your present attitudes and behaviors as part of the Mindful Review practice, you lessen your resistance to those deeper issues. Unification of the Discriminating Mind and Recognizing Effortlessness Before unification, many unconscious sub-minds have conflicting intentions. Through the pacification process, sub-minds of the discriminating mind start coming together around the common intention to focus on the sensations of the breath. With this growing consensus, there are fewer dissenting sub-minds to project distracting mental objects into peripheral awareness. Recognizing effortlessness is like learning to ride a bike. There's that moment when you realize that if we stop constantly trying to correct and control and just keep pedaling, the bike will stay upright by itself. In the same way, when meditating, we need to learn to let go when the time is right, moving into effortlessness. This sounds easy enough. However, you've been making an effort for so long that you may not recognize it isn't necessary anymore. The mind has grown so accustomed to maintaining intense levels of vigilance and effort that doing so has become automatic. In addition, this diligence actually keeps the natural joy of a unified mind from arising. You certainly may have experienced short bursts of joy, but the joy that comes from unification is still being blocked by habitual diligence. Letting go is the best way to discover if the time is right to drop all vigilance and effort. Just intentionally relax your effort from time to time and see what happens. If distraction or dullness returns, you know you need to keep making effort. However, if exclusive attention continues, mindfulness remains strong and joy and happiness arise, you've achieved effortlessness. Still, don't be in a hurry. If you drop diligence too often and too soon, your practice becomes inconsistent, which can hold you back. Wait until you have some sign that the time may be right. You might notice, for instance, that no mental objects have appeared in peripheral awareness for a very long time, or perhaps your overall mental state is much calmer and clearer. Or again, you might notice that even strange or unpleasant physical sensations are much easier to ignore since no thoughts arise in reaction to them. These are the signs of mental pliancy. When you observe them, it's time to let go of that watchful feeling of being instantly ready to defend your focus. An Accidental Discovery of Effortlessness The Epiphany of the Flies I wasn't taught to let go intentionally in order to test for effortlessness. In fact, I wasn't even aware that I should be striving for effortlessness at all. The discovery was a complete accident. I had been in a very long, very dry period of practice, with only a few minor signs of piti, thumbs and hands twitching, salivation, an occasional bit of light in my visual field. There was definitely no joy. Then, during one particular meditation, several flies started crawling on my face. They crawled over my lips, my eyelids, 
and even in and out of my nostrils. I was exerting a tremendous effort in the face of this immense distraction to keep the flies in peripheral awareness and my attention on the breath. Sometimes the flies would go away, but then they'd shortly return. I stayed in a heightened state of vigilance any time they were gone, because at any moment they could be back. It seemed to go on forever, but at some point the last fly left and didn't come back for a long time. Eventually, the thought arose that maybe they were gone for good. What a relief! I let go of all effort and just rested on the sensations of the breath. Immediately I felt joy spreading over me in waves, and then stabilizing. I realized that I didn't have to keep trying so hard. And in that moment I fully grasped the significance of letting go. In other words, prior to the flies, I had reached a point where effort was no longer needed, but I hadn't known it. So I didn't take that last step toward effortlessness. I've been grateful to those flies ever since. Continuing Obstacles to Effortlessness After that lesson, I still had trouble dropping effort and letting go. I realized that it's one thing to know you're capable of effortless focus, but it's something else entirely to let go of the effort. Letting go was still a challenge in subsequent sessions, and I couldn't repeat the experience at well. Then, even when I succeeded in suspending the effort, the waves of joy would end as soon as the urge to take control returned. Like many people, I had a deeply entrenched need to be in control, due to desire and fear. I needed to overcome this control issue before I could experience the joy of effortlessness with any consistency. The answer was, and still is, complete surrender. I had to simply stop caring whether it would happen or not, while at the same time totally trusting that it would. I had to let the practice happen without doing the practice. We're all different, and maybe you won't hold on so tightly. Yet keep in mind that even when you know it's safe to drop all effort, actually letting go can still be hard. Most of us have a lifetime habit of being in control of thinking we are a self who is an active agent responsible for making things happen. Don't try to make anything happen. Just trust in the process and let it unfold naturally. When you reach the end of stage seven, there's enough unification to produce the effortlessness of mental pliancy, which always comes with some meditative joy. Joy seems to be the natural state of a unified mind. And the more unified a mind is, the more joyful it is. Joy is also the glue that helps keep a mind unified. However, you can count on desire and aversion, worry and remorse, ill will, impatience, fear and doubt to eventually perturb the mind, erode unification, and shift the mind back into a state of inner conflict and dissatisfaction. Stage 8 is about conditioning the mind to sustain a high degree of unification even in the face of hindrances. Then meditative joy is fully developed, and the glue has set. Experiencing joy while breathing in, he trains himself. Experiencing joy while breathing out, he trains himself. Experiencing pleasure while breathing in, he trains himself. Experiencing pleasure while breathing out, he trains himself. Anapanasati Sutta Conclusion You have mastered stage seven when you can consistently achieve effortlessness. The restless tendency of attention to follow objects in peripheral awareness has been tamed. When you first sit down, you still need to go through a settling-in process. You will count your breaths, sharpen your attention and awareness, and diligently ignore everything until the mind is pacified and competing intentions disappear.